This video is sponsored by Real Vision. We've already talked about the rise of passive investing. More and more investors are paying lower fees by hugging indexes. But what about the pros that live on these fees? What are these hedge fund titans supposed to do? That's what we're gonna talk about on this week's episode of The One Thing. What's going on investors, AK here. The classic hedge fund model is called two and 20. Basically it's a 2% fee on assets and then a 20% fee on performance above agreed upon benchmark or hurdle. So let's say you're managing a thousand bucks for me and we have a two and 20 model in place. The benchmark does 5%, but you managed to do 10%. That means I'm gonna have to pay you $20 for managing my money and then 20% on the 5% performance you did above the benchmark. So that's another 10 bucks. So this works out for everyone in this scenario because my thousand dollars turned into 1,070, which means I made 20 $20 more than if I just stuck with the index. And then you made $30 out of the deal. But an agreement like that is tough to keep long term because when you don't do so well, I still got to pay you that 2% on assets. So that means you still get the 2% even if you don't beat the benchmark and even if you lose money. So if you stop beating the market and that happens, you're going to be getting some angry phone calls from me. So recently with hedge fund returns slowing up and more people going into passive, hedge funds have been cutting their fees. Anthony Scaramucci recently talked about it on Real Vision. I think over the last decade, we've gone from on a hedge funds, we've gone from two and 20, so 2% yep. management fee, 20% of the it's profit. It's probably one and a quarter in 12. Now. Is that where it is now? So yeah, I think so. So that's we're one and a quarter in 12 yeah, on that's what average. It feels like. Yeah, that's what it feels like. What's the evolution of the hedge fund industry? The, it's like our society. The rich are getting richer. The hedge fund community, the people that have the assets are growing their assets, and the other people are not. I mean, look, I mean, you know, a lot of ways, our fund of funds is like an outsourced multi-strat, right? So sure. we'll outsource to who we think are the best and brightest in the space that we want. I think, yeah, good players are going to get more money. Weak players are going to get blown out. So we just heard the Mooch talk about two ways to stay competitive. You can drop your fees or you can be really, really, really good. And if you could do both at the same time, that's even better. But there's also another option. You can be really different. Maybe you can pick tech stocks better than the next guy, but in all honesty, you're not gonna do that much better than a tech stock ETF. So where can you go to find an edge? Well, Kian Zandier of Sturgeon Capital is going to Uzbekistan. Here he is explaining the opportunity as he sees it. Look at what has changed basically overnight. What happened was two and a half years ago, the previous president, which was uh, uh, leading the country for about 25 years died. And if you think of how the country was beforehand, there was a closed socialist uh, economy, pretty much not like North Korea. Uh, it was completely isolated from the neighbors and, and, and from, the broader, from the broader world. What happened then was when the president died, the prime minister became the president. And the, the general consensus was that it would be a continuation of what was there before. But to everyone's surprise, overnight, he decided to completely reform the country and has been quite aggressive and ambitious in the reforms that he's uh, uh, taking place. So, so there are wide-ranging reforms which the, which the government is undertaking. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the most significant one was the, the FX liberalization. What came alongside that was the capital amnesty, where, where foreign funds could basically come back to the country at minimal tax rates. Uzbekistan's economic liberalization is providing a huge investment opportunity. And if you're one of the rare hedge fund managers who have access to Uzbek stocks, then you might be in a really good position. Along the same lines, Michael Schwimmer, the CEO of Big League Advance, he's presented an unusual investment avenue where he can charge actually more than the two and 20 fees. Using advanced analytics, he's able to invest in a share of the future earnings of minor league baseball players. These are the same analytics they use to beat Las Vegas odds makers. You gotta check out the full interview to see what I'm really talking about, but here's a clip of Schwimmer explaining it a little bit more. I wanna raise money for five years, I wanna raise a $130 million fund, and I wanna do it at a three and 30. And my people back me were like, three and 30, 30. you're crazy. Yeah, two and 20 is dying, how are you gonna get- Two and 20 is dying, how are you gonna get three and 30? Well, I think this is gonna work. I think this is, this is there, like, all right, you can go try and then we can cut it down when you're not successful. <laughs> well, five weeks later, we raised $182 million. I actually had to return 52 million because there's only so many baseball players. Yeah. So yeah, he actually had to return money to his investors because it's easier to raise money in some of these frontier strategies than to actually deploy it. So his fund might be small because it has to be, but maybe he's an example of one of those A students that the Mooch was talking about. Another area that's become really hot is crypto. Will Peace joined Real Vision to talk about how instant institutional players look at the market. The awareness, the knowledge, uh, the understanding is, is materially higher uh, than even just a year ago. Um, I think it's, it's becoming too big to ignore. And so, you know, and, and certainly, you know, with, with Yale and a few other pension funds or endowments entering the space, you know, that's kind of eased, it, it's, it's made it easier for others to kind of reduce some of that career risk and headline risk of yep. know, being the first mover into, again, a very new, um, asset class where 
I would say majority of the investor public is, is misinformed or underinformed at a minimum. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think you know that's that's progressing. I think we would have expected it would have happened more quickly, but you know it's it's directionally going in the right way. So it's so funny is like in back in 2017, I think that was the big theme. It's like oh, institutional money is getting into it, but you know everyone moves a little bit slower than that. Yeah. And now we saw you know now it's actually coming in, and it's like no one cares, yeah. which is <laughs> I mean they they're starting to, but uh, yeah, and. and I think we've still just at the tip of the iceberg of actual capital coming in, right? There's been a lot of announcements over the last year about, you know, the likes of Fidelity and Bact, and, you know, now you have TD Ameritrade and E-Trade, um, you know, offering. But it's those offerings are still, you know, in, in you know, they're just onboarding initial clients or they're only offering it to a subset of you know, institutional clients. So you really haven't seen, you know, the floodgates open. Um, but you are seeing kind of the, the the groundwork as it relates to infrastructure, you know, being laid, and these people are are you know investing a lot of capital, or these companies are investing a lot of capital to to make these offerings you know available. So on top of retail and classic hedge funds being interested in crypto, there's institutions like pension funds trying to get in too, and that's pretty wild considering that a few years ago they wouldn't touch crypto with a 10 foot pole. And of course, because we're talking about creative ways to harvest alpha, we got to talk about cannabis. Todd Harrison recently joined Real Vision to talk about the cannabis markets. We're investing in the cannabis space or cannabinoid wellness space across the US. We have some Canadian exposure, but really US, biotech, Australia, some Europe. We're looking out three to five years. We think the market is misunderstood here. Uh, certainly the total addressable market and the use cases are misunderstood. So we're uh, positioning to take advantage of that. You know, if you look at this and you, and you use the dot-com parallel, mm -hmm. uh, that there's going to be a lot of companies that don't make it, but the ones that do are going to be generational opportunities. And that's how we're looking at this. And trying to look through all this near-term volatility, it's a lot of retail holders right now, notoriously emotional retail holders uh, mm -hmm. that are moving with a herd mentality, which is why we're seeing these monolithic moves across the space. So as funds continue to search for alpha and they continue to search for fees, they're having a hard time finding it down the traditional avenues. Oh, so they're taking side streets. Traditional funds are lowering fees, but funds like Schwimmers are actually raising them because they could argue that they found a competitive edge. Others like Todd Harrison at CB1 Capital, they're focusing on specific parts of the market to hone in on an edge. Even the large institutions have had to adapt. That's why pension funds and endowment funds are turning to crypto. So instead of saying that passive is killing active, maybe we should say that passive is killing uncreative alpha. If you want to get introduced to more of these strategies, or maybe you want to help building one of these unconventional theses, then make sure you subscribe to Real Vision. I'll talk to you next week. <laughs>